Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, I have Kevin Craig on the show. He is with Vine and Fig Tree. He also has a website called Would Jesus Celebrate Independence Day? This episode is very timely for the upcoming holiday. Two questions need to be asked. First, would the founders celebrate today's Independence Day? And more importantly, would Jesus celebrate Independence Day? Let's go. Yeah. Left, right, left, right, left. We got our marching orders, man. Left, right, left, right. Would you rather serve God than serve Caesar? You feel me? Right. I'm just trying to live what he said. Before we get into this, why don't you give us a little background of yourself, and then we'll we'll, we'll talk about uh, Independence Day a little bit. Well, you mentioned uh, that I've got a little nonprofit organization called Vine and Fig Tree, and it's not world famous, but the purpose is to promote or maybe in some way help accelerate the fulfillment of the Vine and Fig Tree prophecy in Micah chapter 4. He talks about a day we beat our swords into plowshares and everyone dwells securely under his own vine and fig tree. And I studied law. I passed the California bar exam, but there's actually a Supreme Court case that says if you're a a Christian, and my definition of a Christian is someone who says we must obey God rather than man, so that if there's any conflict, you're going to disobey the state. And they said, well, you can't be a lawyer with that kind of attitude. So they said I couldn't take the oath to support the Constitution. And it turns out you cannot become a naturalized American citizen if you were born in a foreign country and you're a Christian at least if you're a Christian who says we must obey God rather than man. So I uh, joined a movement called the Catholic Worker, even though I'm not Catholic, but that was an organization that was founded back during the uh, Great Depression. The communists had a newspaper called The Daily Worker, and the founders of The Catholic Worker, Dorothy Day and a Frenchman named Peter Morin, started publishing a newspaper. They called it The Catholic Worker, as opposed to The Daily Worker, and they started a kind of a chain of houses of hospitality. So for the better part of a decade, I was uh, renting a uh, real old 12-bedroom house in a bad part of town in Southern California. And we put the word out on the street that anybody who wanted to get clean and sober and get a job could stay in our house until they saved up first and last month's rent. And we had probably over a thousand different homeless people, illegal immigrants and other people like that in our house and served up thousands of meals to people. That's how we got to know them. We'd, we, we'd invite them over for lunch and we'd, you know, talk to them and see if they were a, a good fit for our house. And let's see, right now I'm working in a hospital, uh, just cleaning up the operating room and whatever they need cleaned up. And in my spare time, I throw some things up on the internet, like would Jesus celebrate independence day.com. There's a whole lot in this. I mean, I mean, there's so much to unpack with this. Just this one website. I I didn't read through it all. I just kind of hit on some on some points on it. But since you're the one that put it together, we're just going to kind of feed off of you. Uh, let's kind of break this up into two two different parts. But let's start with if the founders were alive today, do you think they would be outside celebrating Independence Day? I don't think they'd be celebrating. I think they'd be outraged. I think they'd be angry because. The Declaration of Independence, and that's technically what we're supposed to be celebrating on Independence Day, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, says they risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to abolish a government which they said was a tyranny. But today's government, I don't think anybody could dispute, is far more of a tyranny than the government they abolished. And, you know, here we are celebrating this Declaration of Independence, but we're not following any of it at all. It's like we totally disregard everything that it says. So I don't think they would celebrate at all. If you recall the Boston Tea Party, that involved a tax on tea, which was three pence per pound. And Benjamin Franklin wrote that the British thought they could get away with that tax because it was so small. And the American colonists, they were good Englishmen. They still had their tea, but they only drank about 10 pounds of tea per year. So that was a nothing tax. Today, we have uh, taxes, you know, 10 times that amount on every gallon of gas, and we certainly use a lot more than 10 gallons a year. And the things that all taxes fund are just 
absolutely atrocious from a moral perspective, considering that the founders were, in terms of social morality, they're very conservative. They would be appalled at what's what's being funded by our taxes today. And our taxes are 20, 30 times more than what they were, what they fought over. And they, they had the slogan, no taxation without representation. Our representation is far worse than theirs was. Uh, for example, back uh, 10 years ago when we had the uh, the big Wall Street bailouts, the people, we the people, told our elected representatives we did not want a massive Wall Street bailout. And at first, Congress voted against the bailout, but then Congress was taken to the woodshed by the real powers that be, and they came back and they voted yes on it. So our views are not represented in Washington in any significant degree. So overall, just looking at that big bird's eye view of the picture, there's no way that uh, the founders who risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to abolish their government would be happy at the fact that we aren't abolishing ours. Right. I, I, I've, I've said this more than once in conversation with other people. I, I'm almost certain, and that's not something I would condone the way I view Christianity now. Now, back when I was a neocon, I'd been like, yeah, it's time for another revolution. But there's no doubt in my mind they'd be gearing up for another war right now. I don't think that they would even hesitate because just like you said, they went to war over a 3% tax <laughs> and compared to what tyranny that they viewed themselves under compared to what we're under right now is vastly different. And Americans today, it's embarrassing how they just, they yawn at it. You talked about that, the, the bell out 10 years ago. Well, what just happened with the, the COVID-19 relief? They're going to give us the, uh, what, $1,200 and then massive corporate bailouts, and nobody batted an eye. I don't, I don't understand how we've got so complacent as a country. Yeah, I think we've been bought off. You think, you think the American people have been bought off? Yeah, people have been bought off by what, what they consider to be the system that the government is responsible for. I mean, like smartphones, our technology. Everybody, everybody I think, gives government the credit for the lifestyle that we have when the government has been the biggest impediment to uh, further growth, greater economic growth. But everybody just thinks if we don't have a government, then we won't have microwave ovens and smartphones and all the things that we like. And you mentioned the the COVID bailout, $1,200 for us, but we're paying, I don't know what the figure is, I forgot, but you know, $6,000 per person for uh, all the other guys who get their big chunky bailouts. And we don't realize we're getting the short end of the stick. It's just a lot of ignorance. And I, I like to say Americans are victims of educational malpractice. The founders were the product of a school system that emphasized certain ideas, which make up what people call a worldview, a life philosophy. And we don't have those things. All the, the things that America's founders said were absolutely essential to a good education, they've all been banned. And now we just have kind of social programming and, and you know, no, learn how to sit in a row and be quiet and take orders is basically what we have, social conditioning rather than a real genuine education in the principles of liberty and morality, which make um, a peaceful and prosperous country possible. So, yeah, it's, it's real sad. Now, the one thing about the founders, if they were to travel through time, just hypothetically, one thing they would see, I think, pretty clearly is that nobody for the most part, is willing to take up arms and risk their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor against this government, not only because they don't want to, because they think the government is their savior, but also because they're just, they're not equipped at all. I mean, a lot of people have guns, but I don't think they're, they're emotionally and psychologically equipped to use the gun, really. But also, our government has nukes. I mean, our government we have, a, we have militarized police, which are really trained well to suppress dissent and resistance. And they're, they have far more arms than we do as people, as potential resistors. And I think any resistance would be crushed unless there's a wholesale change of the way millions of people think about their government, which that's not going to happen by next Thursday. So I think the founders would see that pretty clearly. You just have to talk to average Americans for a few minutes and realize they're nothing like the Americans were two or 300 years ago. Nothing, it's not, not even close. Well, the government's done a, a very good job of placing fear on us. I think that plays a lot into the, there's no resistance. You know, you see these protests going on and the protests are great, but then you see how the government's reacting to it. Just like you said, I mean, they're, they're not out there 
defending the First Amendment, you know, our right to protest or, or freely assemble. They're out there pushing these people around, you know, shooting rubber bullets at them, tear gassing them. They're not protecting their rights. That, that, that's the whole point of government was to protect our liberty. They actively stomp all over our liberty and we let it go. And I think the education is, is a big thing because you could, like you see, you can talk to your average American. They couldn't even tell you what the Constitution says. And if they do know what the Constitution says, they don't need to know the meaning behind it. Like you'd have to go back to read what the founders were saying to each other, like in the in the ratification debates to understand what the Constitution means. Not your average American doesn't know that and they're not going to take time to. I think Americans are too lazy and they do view the government as their savior. Without government, there'd be chaos. Man, there's total chaos right now. And it's all at the hands of the government. I want to read something. John Adams, right after the declaration, he wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail. In this portion of this letter, he said, I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as a great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to Almighty God. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. You will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I'm not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom I can see, the rays of ravishing light and glory, I can see that the end is more than worth all the means and that posterity will triumph in that day's transaction, even all that we should rue it, which I trust in God we shall not. We've lost that, man. We're so far away from that. What, what do they call it? Free range uh, tax slaves. We're a revenue source for the government and we just let it, we just let it happen. Well, that's what I mean. We've been bought off. We have a high level of uh, material standard of living, but it's, it's being bought off. I mean, the, the technology we have is fairly superficial. We have our flat screen TVs and our, our phones and all these things entertain us. And yet uh, America's founders would think, yeah, but what, are the, what is the price you're paying for all this? Your, your liberty, your dignity, all in all, the government is taking more than half of everything you earn if you pay one dime in personal income tax. Now, half the country doesn't pay income tax because they don't, they're not in the tax bracket yet, or maybe they never will be. But if you're in a tax bracket, then the government is taking more than half of everything you earn. And that's because we're so eager to have the government tax those big, bad businesses that are the real source of all the microwave ovens and phones and things that we, we like. And we think that's really great. The government's taxing those big businesses and all their profits, but we're the ones who are paying all those taxes at uh, the check stand because all the taxes are pa passed on to consumers. So when you realize the government is taking a third of your income out of your paycheck through withdrawal, and, and the Supreme Court has ruled that Social Security is not an insurance program, it's not an investment, it's not anything except just another tax, and that Congress has no legal obligation to give you one penny when you retire, it's just a tax. It pays for weapons to go blow off the arms and legs of little children in Yemen and somewhere in the Middle East. So when you realize all those taxes that are taken out of your paycheck, and then half of what's left after withdrawal, after withholding, I mean, Half of what's left is taken at the check stand in terms of, of taxes, which businesses have to pass on at every stage of production until it finally gets to the store. So the government's taking 50, 60 percent of everything you earn. That's that would just absolutely astonish the founders. Like I said, their their taxes in the average colony was one or two percent, one or two percent in Virginia. Scholars estimate it may have been as high as three percent in Virginia which is why a lot of founders came from Virginia, perhaps. But we're paying 20, 30 times more in taxes today for a government which is destroying civilization, really. But the founders were, were conflicted. The founders were in contradiction because on the one hand, you, you said earlier, you spoke earlier about the government's purpose is to protect our rights. And there's a sense in which they believed that. There's a sense in which they believed, as Christians, they believed that God in the Bible requires human beings to create governments, that they thought that was a religious obligation to create a, a civil government. And so they, they thought it was a good thing. But on the other hand, they also recognized more than we do that government is the real threat to our liberties. 
And to say that the, the government is supposed to protect our liberties, actually, it's the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that's supposed to protect our liberties from the government. Because for the most part, it's the government that's the big threat to our freedom of speech, to our freedom of assembly, to our, our Second Amendment rights. The Second Amendment wasn't designed for gun collectors and sportsmen and, and uh, hunters and stuff like that. It was designed to protect our right to overthrow the government by armed revolution if it became a tyranny. And there's a Third Amendment, the quartering of, quartering of troops. These are all things that are designed to protect us from the government. So it's, it's a mistake, I think, to think of the government as being something that protects our liberties. What we thought was, what the founders thought was that without government, we wouldn't be able to protect ourselves from foreign kings, from foreign invasions, and to a lesser extent from criminals or armed mobs. And so we pool our, our right to self-defense in the government. And that's supposed to be a, a, a way to protect us from the downside of the state of nature, as they called it. That's one of the arguments you hear against a, a stateless society or anarchism is, what if a, a foreign country attacked us? Who's going to protect us? What's misunderstood is we are being actively attacked by our very own government daily. Just talk about taxes. That is an attack. They are attacking us. They're they stealing our money from us. And even the Bible says to render under Caesar, I get all that. But it's still done with at the barrel of a gun. Because if you don't pay your taxes, what happens? You're going to go to jail. That's all out of coercion. We have the highest prison population of any country in the world. And I believe fully that the United States government is probably the largest criminal organization this world's ever seen. And we keep putting them in office. I mean, it, it, it drives me crazy. I, this is why I don't participate in it anymore because I can't in good conscience take part in that. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a party to it at all anymore. It just, I'm just going to follow Christ. I agree with you that the United States government is the most dangerous and evil institution on the, on the face of the earth. It's even more evil and more dangerous than something like North Korea or Iran, because the average human being on this planet is more likely, statistically speaking, to have his or her rights infringed by an agent of the United States government than they are to have their rights to life, liberty, or property infringed by someone from North Korean government or from Iranian government. I mean, the tentacles of the federal government are everywhere. And sometimes they're disguised as NGOs, and sometimes they're disguised as private contractors who work security for various multinational corporations, which are essentially arms of the U.S. government. But yeah, it's crazy. And that's why there's really no risk, I don't think, of some other government invading us. Uh, I don't think there's any risk of that at all. And North Korea certainly isn't going to invade us. Do away with the United States government. And I bet a lot of those people that hate us right now wouldn't hate us anymore. <laughs> They'd probably leave us the hell alone anyway. You know, If we abolished the U.S. government today, we would have 50 new nations. And none of those nations would have a track record of having you know, bombed um, anybody in Iraq or anything like that. All of the complaints that Osama bin Laden had when he issued his uh, fatwa against the United States wouldn't apply to these 50 new nations. We'd be a lot less threatened by any other nation because all these other terrorist organizations wouldn't have a beef against, you know, Tennessee for you, Missouri for me. And so uh, that would change, that would change everything. And I don't think that if we, I don't think the people of any state would, would want to go out and uh, start bombing people in the Middle East to protect our oil because it's the United States that's keeping us from accessing uh, all the oil that's up in Prudhoe Bay and Gull Island in Alaska. So the, the U.S. government is our biggest threat as people. And uh, really, the, the idea of a foreign invasion, I, I can't see that happening. North Korea wouldn't put its troops on, foreign, on American soil because as soon as the North Korean troops were to break into a Walmart, they would see that their chances are much better to defect and live here in the United States than they are to go back to North Korea. <laughs> so I think the whole idea of the government protecting us National defense is kind of a myth. Oh, sure. It is for sure now. You mentioned Yemen, and I, 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 sometimes I wonder, actually, I don't wonder. I, don't th the, I think it's willful ignorance from the American people that they don't realize how far-reaching our government is. We've talked about Yemen on this podcast before, and you don't hear Yemen talked about on, on uh, mainstream media. 
why in the world are we in Yemen? And it's like you said, if, you, if, if people knew what we were doing in Yemen right now, I would hope that it would disgust them. Now, I don't know. They might say, well, they're over there defending our freedoms. No, they're not. Yemen has never attacked America. Yemen has no interest in attacking them. They might now. I don't know. If we're over there blowing up their hospitals and their schools and shutting down their water supply, yeah, I'd be pretty pissed off too. Yeah, I think people in America like to live in illusion and dream. They like to just say everything's okay and it's not a problem. So they just, it's willful ignorance. They choose to be ignorant because they really, they might suspect the truth, but they don't really want to know the truth because then that would put some kind of moral obligation on them to stop evil when they know it's happening. So people choose to be ignorant. Right. And it's, it's sad. It's sad. And it's actually very frustrating to me. I think on this website, you posted a video where we're, you're asking the Americans, you know, just average American, what Independence Day is for, why we celebrate Independence Day. And nobody knows. And I think maybe it's willful ignorance. It's just another day off work. Let's go have a barbecue. Let's shoot some fireworks. Let's drink some beer. You know, it's, I don't know if they even know that we're not independent. We're not even, we're not free in this country. People talk about being free in America. It's baloney. And it's so frustrating just in a you know, regular conversation with coworkers or something. The blank stares I get from people, man, I can talk to them like me and you were having this conversation. Me and you can go back and forth and agree with each other. But if, 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 you or I were just to talk to the, the average person about this, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. They don't understand it. And I, and I don't know why they will not just to go to try to seek it out because I don't know, maybe if you get beaten down so much, you just, you just kind of take it. You know, you think some people are starting to wake up to it a little bit. We may not see a stateless society on a grand scale in our lifetime. I'm pretty sure I won't. I don't know how old you are. I'm 45, but I think if we keep talking, we keep talking and keep talking, like John Adams was talking about posterity, maybe in the future, more people are going to wake up and maybe they can start shutting some of this down. But I think the only way we're really going to do that is just to follow Christ. Founders, if they were alive today, they wouldn't even recognize America. If the early church, you know, prior to Constantine, they would not recognize the church today. The church is so ingrained with the state right now that they wouldn't recognize anything that's going on with the church. It wouldn't be the church to them. Well, I'm pretty sure that if I were to uh, give an introductory letter to any pastor of any any organization that calls itself a church, if I told them what I believed, they wouldn't want me within a thousand feet of the front door of their church. Being an anarchist, for example, that's not a selling point if you want to become a member of a church. Yeah, basically. I haven't been to church uh, in, in a while. And I one, of, one thing that that kind of turned me off to it is every time I was go, I went to church, I was getting preached about tithes and I'm happy to give. I'm, you know, even the Bible talks about God loves a, a cheerful giver, but I quit tithing to a church and just found a charity to give to. And I'm a lot more cheerful about it. You know, somebody took, it's a, it's a, a Christian based charity and they're doing a whole lot of good around the Memphis area. And I'm a lot happier giving to them than I am to a church when they're trying to send their kids to a church camp or buying a new PA system or stuff like that. I just, I mean, I love music, don't get me wrong, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Hey folks, Craig here, and I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. You said there are two reasons why Jesus wouldn't be celebrating Independence Day if he were here on Earth in 2020 right now. Jesus hates violence. Independence Day is about shooting tax collectors, not something Jesus would celebrate. Jesus said, pay your taxes, render unto Caesar. The violent overthrow of the government is prohibited in the Bible, but celebrated on Independence Day. And two, Jesus hates hypocrisy. Americans who celebrate the killing of the red co- the red coats don't lift a finger against tax rates, which are 20 times greater than taxes in 1776. We've covered all that. And I like those two points because we all know that Jesus is, is against violence. What's not talked about enough is how he's against hypocrisy as well. The whole idea, when you think about Independence Day, it is hypocritical 
as a Christian to celebrate Independence Day when it was celebrating violence. Well, it's also hip hypocritical as an American. I think the founding fathers would say we're hypocrites to say we're Americans and we're celebrating the Declaration of Independence when we're ignoring all of its principles. And uh, I mean, we're getting back to the previous subject, but another, another aspect of this I like to point out is that technically, from a constitutional law perspective, it's unconstitutional, according to our current government, for a public school teacher to teach children that the Declaration of Independence is actually true. You can teach that some people believed it was true back then, but you can't actually say that the propositions in the Declaration of Independence are objectively true. They're true even if the government doesn't believe them. They're true even if nobody else believes them. They're just true that our rights come from God, that there's such a thing as a supreme judge of the world, that we can have a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. I mean, how many public school kids even know what providence is? And there's all these Christian concepts about uh, man and, the, and uh, the laws of nature and of nature's God and so forth, which you cannot teach in a public school because of this myth of the separation of church and state. So that's pretty hypocritical to celebrate a document which has been effectively banned by the government. But then a lot of what makes America what it is today are gross ignorance and even you might say rebellion against the principles of Christianity itself, and most notably the Christian ethic of Jesus, which is to love your enemy and be willing to go with a second mile and other, other things like that, which I think people, I think everybody knows that in some sense, Jesus commanded his followers to be pacifists, but there's always some excuse. There's always some PhD out there somewhere who has a, a theory as to why it is we really can't do that or why it's just in your heart or it's just in your home, but it's not in society and it has nothing to do with the government. So that opens up that whole big can of worms about the relationship between the ethic of Christianity and the theory of government. Let me ask you something, because you said you studied law. I, I, I've heard this before from other people that, that have been involved with that, but do they actually teach in law school, do they actually teach the original intent of the Constitution, or is it based off of what the Supreme Court has said? Well, there's you can always find one or two law professors who adhere to an originalist theory. And we even have a couple of Supreme Court justices who at least pay lip service to that idea of original intent. But for the most part, it's uh, it's based on precedent. It's based on the idea of that the Constitution is a living document. And we can sort of make the Constitution mean whatever we want it to mean. But a, a really strict understanding of the Constitution, I think, makes you way over on the libertarian scale, which you don't have any of that hardly at all in law schools. I mean, out of a thousand professors, you'll have, I don't know, maybe one or two who could be called libertarians. I'm just guessing. I don't know, because it's been a long time since I've had any contact with law schools. But for example, uh, especially with regard to the Christian principles and this idea which I spoke of as the myth of the separation of church and state, I, I like David Barton's book, Original Intent. Now, secularists just hate David Barton, and they'll tell you all kinds of bad things about him. And, and like I say, Barton, he's a Republican. He wouldn't want me near his rally. I don't think he'd let me in his church. But what he's done is he's compiled a lot of forgotten quotes and Supreme Court decisions and other court decisions and laws and so forth, which show us the original intent of the, of the country was not to have an atheistic government, a secular government, which we have now, but rather it was much more aligned with Christian thinking. And that aspect of original intent is certainly not taught by, I mean, one out of a thousand maybe would uh, agree with what Barton is saying, but that's very uh, an extreme minority. It's the living constitution. It's not original intent to make the answer short. Yeah, I've heard a, a living constitution as well. I wanted to talk some more about Jesus and why he would not celebrate Independence Day. You know, what I, like I touched on those two reasons, but I want you to go a little bit further into it as far as it's a holiday of violence. What would Jesus we were out celebrating Independence Day? Well, Independence Day, um, there's two aspects to it. One is that tyranny is bad. Now, that's, I think that's a good biblical idea. Tyranny is bad. And I think I've got a website called anarchistmanifesto.com, which argues that the Bible is actually a, an anarchist manifesto, 
that when you look at it from cover to cover, it's the most anti-state document in human history. So that's a good thing that the Declaration of Independence is very critical of tyranny and is willing to label a government as a tyranny, even though it's, you know, one twentieth or one, even even one fiftieth as tyrannical as the government we have today. So that's something good we can learn from. The problem with the Declaration of Independence is, well, it's the Second Amendment. Now, I'm against gun control because gun control means that the government has a monopoly of guns. And that's a disaster waiting to happen. But the Second Amendment, as I said, its goal was not to give us the right to have a gun collection nailed up on a trophy cabinet, but it was the right to overthrow the government by force. It's the right to kill tax collectors. And that's what the American Revolution was. And that's what the Declaration of Independence inaugurated. It was saying, you don't have the right to come in here and tax us without representation. You don't have the right to do all these things that you're doing. And the Declaration of Independence has this long list of things that the government is doing, which are bad, although they sort of pale in comparison to what the government's doing today. But it's basically saying, we're going we're gonna to stop you, even if, if, it, if it means killing you. And that's, I think, a completely unchristian attitude. Uh, uh, Jesus says, render unto Caesar. Uh, Romans 13 says, pay your taxes. Uh, Jesus says, love your enemies, resist not evil. There's all these commandments which are really clear, and everybody kind of knows, uh-oh, this, this is a pacifistic manifesto here, and that's true. But the Declaration of Independence says, if you cross this line, we're going to kill you. I mean, that's what, the, that's what the police, that's what the law says to us today. It says, you cannot sell cigarettes unless they have the taxes paid on them. And if you continue to do this, we're going to stop you. We're going to arrest you. We're going to put you in jail. And if you continue to arrest, we will kill you. And Eric Garner is the uh, name to remember in that scene. So the government is willing to kill you if you violate its laws. But the, but the Declaration of Independence is basically saying, we're going to kill you if you infringe on our liberties. So you have two groups of Christians, the American and the British, their worldviews, their culture, everything about them is so similar. They really are similar. And there's, some, there's a lot of great uh, web, web pages on the Lou Rockwell site, lourockwell.com, about how George III was really not a bad guy compared to who we have today. He was a good Christian. He was, a, he was not a bad guy. But there's just this inertia of government that people who work for the government think they have to support the government you know, to the death. And people are willing to kill each other over trivial amounts of taxation. And so here's these Christians killing each other, which just cannot possibly be a Christian thing. And so I would think Christians would oppose Christians killing each other in direct violation of commands not to do that and to just go ahead and, and pay the taxes. But then, you know, surely the Americans could appeal, and, and they were, but they could have continued to appeal to the British as Christians and say, look, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not playing fair. This isn't right. This shouldn't be happening. And maybe it would be that a second generation of British would eventually say, okay, you're right. We're going we're gonna to bring back all these taxes and, and, and we're sorry about that. And you don't have to kill tens of thousands of Christians in this war for independence. And Romans 13 says, your goal is not to be independent. That's not your primary concern. It's nice. And you can work for that in various nonviolent ways. But the idea of killing off people Romans 13 says, God put them in place. God has his reasons and you're not to, you're to be subject to them rather than killing them off. So we're celebrating a document that has some good sides, but also has a very bad side. And the bad side is the willingness to kill human beings to save a few pennies on your taxes. You talked about the Bible being anarchist from cover to cover. Um, Deanna, our, our mutual question about how, how Christ called us to be anarchists. I'm looking at it right now. It says vine and fig tree. Some who call themselves anarchists say they believe in no law at all. From a Christian perspective, this is an impossibility. And you you talk about what the word anarchy means. And you also say that Christian believes that Jesus Christ is the only legitimate archist. This, what, what I, I heard her, she talked about archists, and I've never heard this term before. I've always just heard anarchist. But I guess it's just a part of the word anarchist. What does archist mean? Um the word, the English word anarchist comes from two Greek words, actually a Greek letter, the word, the letter alpha or a is called the alpha privative, and it means not. 
And then there's the word archist. Now, in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45, Jesus catches his disciples arguing about who is going to be the greatest in the coming kingdom of God. Now, they, at this point, were still under the delusion that the coming kingdom would be established by a military victory over the Roman guards, the Roman legions, the Roman Empire. And they didn't realize it was a kingdom of peace and not a kingdom that was founded in war. And they thought that when the kingdom comes in, they would get to be big shots. And Jesus corrects them. He says, the kings of the Gentiles, and if you're Jewish and you hear that phrase, the kings of the Gentiles, you're thinking about the Romans, you're thinking about the Babylonians, you're thinking about the Assyrians, you're thinking about all the people that have invaded Israel and taken people captive and so forth. You're thinking about the bad guys, the kings of the Gentiles. Those are all the bad guys. Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles love to be archists. They are accounted by the Gentiles to be archists. I mean, he uses the Greek word from which we derive the English word anarchist. And Jesus says, but it's not supposed to be this way among you. You are to be servants, not archists. So what is an archist in that context? It's a person who feels like he has the right, he has some kind of divine right to invade other countries, put them under tribute, turn them into cash cows, boss them around, kill them if they resist. In short, an archist is someone who believes he has the right to impose his own will on other people by force or threats of violence. And that's totally inconsistent with, with what a Christian is, which is one who is a servant of others. Is willing, the Christian believes it's better to be killed than it is to kill, because that's what Jesus did. And uh, Peter, in his first epistle, 1 Peter 2, says, we are to follow in Jesus' steps follow in his steps at precisely this point where he wasn't willing to kill just to defend his own life. So an archist is someone who believes he has the right to impose his will on other people by force or threats of violence. And of course, that's what the state is. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> like I said, I never heard just archists. I've always just heard anarchists and, you know, I understood what that meant, but I never heard anybody just calling people archists before. But I, and I didn't realize that was something that a word that, that Jesus was using or in the Greek, that you know, what he was saying as well. Well, I, I like using that word because the word anarchist has so much baggage attached to it. People have all kinds of ideas about an anarchist being someone who engages in riots and is lawless and doesn't believe in private property and all kinds of things. But if you talk about, well, I'm not an archist, then that sort of gets people thinking without all that baggage being brought into it. That's interesting. Maybe I'll start trying to do that then because I, I always use anarchist because I, I like it as the trigger <laughs> because it'll trigger a conversation because what well, you see it going on right now, Donald Trump's calling these people out rioting there. He's calling them anarchists. And oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was sitting at work the other day on break and we got two TVs and one's always on Fox news and the, the commentators on there kept saying anarchists, anarchists. And I could feel the hair on my neck just starting to bristle. Yeah. And we were on lunch break and I stood up, I said, that is not anarchy. And I went on a five minute spill about what actual <laughs> anarchism is. And everybody just, everybody just was just looking at me. Now I've told them, they know I'm an anarchist, you know, they're, they're, they're aware of it, but they've never heard me actually just like go off on it like that. Cause I was just getting so frustrated listening to those people. And it, cause people were so in tune to what they're saying. I felt like I had to say something. I said, it's not anarchy. That is, that's thuggery. I mean, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing anarchist about that. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when I left the break room because <laughs> I can't imagine what was yeah, yeah. said about me after that. I don't. I mean, I don't care, but I don't know. I kind of. I kind of like getting into stuff like that with them. Like I said, the blank stairs are starting to get a little creepy, though. It's like talking to a zombie. I like to say that a riot, like we're seeing now, and these riots have certainly resulted in an uptick of the use of the word anarchist. But riots are not a situation of anarchy; they're a situation of polyarchy or multiarchy. There's all these people who are trying to impose their will on the world or their will on somebody else using violence, initiating force against peaceful people. That's the mark of an archist. So you've got all these archists, all of them believe that they're entitled to other people's property and they're going to use violence to get their way. That's the, that's the, the, the essence of an archist is using violence to get their way. And that's what's happening in a riot. All these people getting their way, telling people off by violence. That's not the absence of archists. That's a whole bunch of wannabe archists. 
All right, let's talk about Romans 13 a little bit. Because and you even mentioned in this uh, on this website as well, because it's brought up a lot when you start talking about a stateless society. He said, the question is often asked after one becomes acquainted with the responsibilities and duties of a Christian anarchist, like forgiving enemies rather than declaring war on them. We don't want to have to take Christ's sermon on the mount too literally, and we want to justify our vengeance against our enemies by saying we must be practical. And we usually turn to Romans 13 to do that. And then you said, read the chapter in, in its context, Romans 12. Then, you know, Romans 13 is always brought up. They never bring up Romans 12. They never talk about Romans 12. And Romans 12 talks about how we're supposed to act. Romans 13 is talking about how the state acts. Well, I, I, I have a website, Romans13.com, which talks about Romans 13 in quite detail. The first thing I would start off with is in the very first verse, the word powers were to submit to the powers that be. And that word powers, every time that word is used in the New Testament, the Greek word, which is it's exousiae, and it's the plural. Every time that word exousiae is used in the New Testament, it means demonic powers. Everybody in Paul's day, everybody in the first century believed that governments and empires were animated and overseen and guided by demons. Now, in, in the Roman Empire, the people who are in favor of the Roman Empire, they believed that the demons or the departed spirits or departed, uh, like there's a phrase you may have heard, the, the genius of the emperor. That word genius is actually like the English word genie, and it means a kind of a spirit. Maybe a, a previous, a deceased emperor is now guiding the current emperor, but there's this whole realm of demonic entities, spirits, and so forth that is behind the empire. And there's kind of a nexus between these demonic powers and the emperor and the empire. So back in Daniel 10, for example, Daniel is praying and the angel comes and says, I would have got here sooner in answer to your prayer, but I had to fight off the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. And it's evident that they're talking about some kind of demonic, not physical, but in the spiritual realm, conflict. So Paul is talking about something which Christians and Jews understood to be evil. This demonic emperor, this demonic empire. And that's what Paul is talking about. And so he says, be subject to this evil demonic nexus of power and, and violence and force and so forth. And, and that, that's carrying through the discussion he was started in Romans chapter 12, where he's saying basically the same thing Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't resist evil. Don't take vengeance in the form of violence against evil. Leave vengeance to God and overcome evil with good. That good, and especially the preaching of the word, the word has power, which is greater than the sword. The Bible says that several times. The word is a spiritual power, a living word, which is more powerful than the sword, which is more powerful than the empire. So do good to your enemies, love those who hate you and persecute you, and let the, the works of good and the word, the good word of, of God, have its power, and it'll eventually take down the state. So Romans 13 isn't talking about something that's good, although God uses everything, even evil things, work together for our good, but the empire is evil, and it's not a good thing for a person to be a part of this evil empire. And so Romans 13 is about this evil thing and how we're supposed to relate to it. It's like Romans 12 is saying, leave vengeance to God, love your enemy, don't resist evil, overcome evil with good, even including, and you turn the page over to Romans 13, even including the most evil thing on the planet, which is the empire and, and the debauched emperors and the whole thing. I mean, the, the Roman empire was just so bad that I don't think most Christians today really realize how totally evil and perverse it was to read about the things that Nero did, for example, just a, a, abominable, incomprehensible evil. And everybody knew that, 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 it was demonic. Everybody knew that this was just terribly evil. But Paul is still saying something very controversial, which is be subject to it and don't resist it and go ahead and pay your taxes. So it's a, it's a pacifist response to unmitigated and unimaginable evil. At least for us Americans, it would be unimaginable. If we were to fly back or be transported back in time to Paul's day, we would just be absolutely 
we'd cry out for mama because it would be so shocking to our system because as bad as we think our government is, the world has been remarkably Christianized in the last uh, 2,000 years. The concepts that we take for granted, like ideas about liberty, uh, the Bill of Rights, those things, they weren't even imagined in Paul's day. It was just pure brute force and perversion. And uh, we would just be absolutely crazy to see what, would, what kind of evil they were thinking about then. But Paul still says we're to be subject. And uh, 1 Timothy 2 says the same thing. We're supposed to be subject to um, the, the state. And, and even it even says that slaves are to be subject to their masters. And we're to be subject to lords and even to those who are tyrannical. Uh, Wycliffe, I think it's 1 Peter 2.18, Wycliffe says we're to, we're to obey not just the good slave masters, but even the tyrants. Titus 3.1 says the same thing. Obey the emperor and be subject to the powers behind the emperor. So this is a, a lot of uh, powerful reading in all these verses and throughout the whole Bible about how, how the, the state originated. It's not something that God ever commanded human beings to create this thing called the state. And it's overseen by demonic powers. And it's a, it's a definitely different way of understanding Romans 13 than most patriotic Fox News watching Americans think of Romans 13 in the state today. It's interesting. I've, I've never heard that part of Romans 13 explained that way, but it makes sense when you think about the temptation of Christ when Satan was offering him power over all of the kingdoms of the world. Then he outright rejected it. You know, but if Satan has the power to give authority over the kingdoms of the world, wouldn't that tell you that the kingdoms of the world are being backed by a demon presence? You know, even in Romans 13, when it says, be subject or to submit, and you go to Acts 5, when it says, but we're to obey God rather than man. Submit and obey are two different words as well, from my understanding, in the Greek, or they have two different definitions. Well, there's, there's differences, but uh, it's still the same thing. I, I, don't think it's, it's a, I don't think it's a difference that makes a difference. I think, uh, I think what Acts 5.29 is saying and what Romans 13 is saying, and also check out, check out 1 Peter 2 and Titus 3.1. Titus 3.1 uses the word obey, and it's also, got, it's also got the same words as Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. They're all saying the same thing. Submit and obey is the same thing. But the difference is we submit to the state when it's infringing on our liberties when it's doing something that's inconvenient to us or even massively inconvenient to us. We submit to that and we obey. For example, if the state commands us to, uh, the state says, everybody has to wear a red, white, and blue shirt on Friday to, to show your patriotism. Well, I, I don't want to wear a red, white, and blue shirt and I don't want to commemorate my patriotism. But I think the Bible says, go ahead and wear the shirt anyway. And, and the state doesn't have any right to say, you wear a shirt, or you're going to jail. We're going to lock you in a cage with a psychopath who's going to sodomize you unless you wear your red, white, and blue shirt on Friday. Well, that's nuts. That's, that's wrong. That's sinful. But Romans 13 says, go ahead and obey. But Acts 5.29 says, we must obey God rather than man. So God says, pay the taxes, even though it's a sin, I believe, to levy a tax on someone, to say, give me your money or I'll lock you in a cage. That's evil to do that. So taxing someone is a sin, but being taxed, that's not a sin. That's just being a victim. So Acts 5.29 says, obey the state if all it's doing is inconveniencing you, even if they have no right to do that to you. But if they command you to violate God's command to you, for example, in, in the case of Acts 5, it was preaching the gospel. The authorities said, don't preach the gospel. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. And the apostles said, we have to. We have to obey God rather than man. So in that case, they would disobey the state. So the only time we have to disobey the state is when it commands us to do something evil. It commands us to do something that's contrary to what God commands us to do. Like, imagine that the state says, our Medicare and Social Security system is experiencing financial difficulties. And they come to you and they say, we have reason to believe, based on medical tests, that your parents are going to have rare diseases in a, in, a, in a decade or so, and that's going to be a real burden on the financial solvency of our Medicare and Social Security system. So we would like you to put your parents to sleep and help prop up the Social Security and Medicare system. Now, God, God's law says, thou shalt not kill. 
God's law says, honor your father and mother. So you would have to say, I'm not going to obey your command for me to put your, my parents to sleep. That's crazy. But if they just simply said something innocuous, like um, bring your parents to uh, a certain place to have a medical checkup since they're getting Medicare, well, that might be an inconvenience and maybe they don't have any right to do that, but go ahead and obey because it's not a sin to do that. It's not a sin to be inconvenienced, but it is a sin to do a direct violation of what God commands you to do. That makes sense. There's a whole lot to unpack, <laughs> There's a whole lot of information, and we could go on forever and ever. But I want people listening to this to go and check out your website and read further into what we were just talking about as far as Christians were called to be anarchists because it's, there's so much to read in there and it's i've shared it with some friends and they're just like wow that's that's pretty that's pretty great but um won't you go ahead and, and and plug whatever you want to plug and then i'll let you get on with the rest of your day okay well uh since it's the fourth of july we've got would jesus celebrate independence day.com there's also uh anarchist manifesto.com uh vine and fig tree.org romans 13.com uh, that's, a, that's, you know, that's a lifetime of, of reading just those websites right there to get through the, all those things. The anarchist manifesto website, none of these are really completely finished yet, but the, the idea between anarchist manifesto.com website is if you were to go through every chapter of the Bible or every verse of the Bible and read it, and then ask yourself, is there any verse in the whole Bible from cover to cover, which any human being on earth today can point to and say, this verse, in this verse, God gives me permission to be an archist. God gives me the permission to tax someone. God gives me permission to lock someone in a cage because they don't do what I want them to do or anything like that. Is there a single verse which anybody can point to and say, here's the verse that God gives me permission and guarantees that I will not be condemned on judgment day for being an archist and for imposing my will on other people by force. And I would say there's no verse that Donald Trump or Joe Biden or anybody can point to and say, this verse gives me a divine permission, a divine right to be an archist. And that changes everything. And the closer you look at all the verses in the Bible, which usually get ignored and never, you never hear a sermon on them in, the, in, the, in a church about how the state is demonic and all the evil that the state does. I mean, the Bible is mostly full of records and denunciations of how evil archists are. So anyway, that's, that's a lifetime of reading to just go through there and uh, purge or deprogram yourself from everything you learned in government-run schools and understand that the Bible is totally opposed to all of that. And one final thing, despite the fact that I'm an anarchist, I run for Congress and as a candidate, and that gets me in front of town halls and candidate forums. And I've been on radio and TV and the front page of the biggest newspaper in my congressional district. My campaign theme is liberty under God. So it's a great opportunity to talk to people. And I've got a couple of websites. One is I am not an us, And then there's another website. It's just kevincraig.us. But that's uh, a place where I discuss all kinds of political issues, social issues, in terms of the view of Christianity, of the view of Christian anarchism. And again, there's thousands, literally thousands of separate web pages on that website, kevincraig.us. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I imagine it's the largest candidate website on the internet, but lots of stuff there. So that's, that's my plug. Thanks very much for that. For sure. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, I I wasn't aware of the uh, anarchistmanifesto.com. I'm going to check that out tonight. I'm building it out. I've still, I've still got a lot of stuff I'm transferring from some other websites, but uh, we're, we're making progress on it little by little. All right, cool, man. Uh, we'll do this again sometime. I appreciate your time today. Oh, it's a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating, as it is the best way to help other people find us. 100% of donations to the show are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about this week's guest and how you can support the show, please visit thebadroman.com. Bad Roman.